everyone. We're very honored to be here this afternoon. My name is Paige Linhart, and this is my colleague Rowan Brooks. We're both third year medical students at the University of South Carolina. Um, we're very excited to present our research into the role of suction assisted lipectomy in the treatment of facial silicone granulomatosis, specifically within a transgender population. We'd like to provide, or we'd like to begin by providing a little bit of background information. For many male to female transgender patients, Masculine facial features are often cited as common sources of gender dysphoria and relative discomfort. While makeup and hairstyling have historically been used to mitigate some of the discomfort from these features, many patients feel that this is uh, not an adequate coverage and seek additional measures. Now, as many of you are likely aware, transgender population has long faced discrimination and multiple barriers to care. There has been um, historical discrimination against gender affirming surgeries. And the cost of these surgeries has previously been um, not covered by insurance or many of our patients are uninsured. Additionally, there's a shortage of physicians that are trained in transgender medicine and specific procedures, surgical and otherwise. Um, paired with like this high financial burden basically leads to an inaccessibility of care. So many transgender patients have unfortunately become victims of illicit substance injections. So foreign materials are being introduced to the face to introduce a more fa feminine facial contour over time. The most commonly injected substance is silicone. Unfortunately, it's not frequently medical grade. Other substances include vegetable oil, paraffin, and Teflon paste. Additionally, and unfortunately, many of the people who are doing these injections are not licensed medical professionals, which can ultimately lead to a number of complications, which Rowan will discuss here. Injectable fillers may produce a wide variety of unintended reactions, ranging from self-limited minor responses to more severe complications. For injected facial silicone specifically, uh, this includes granulomas, nodularity, migration, and chronic cellulitis. Of these, silicone granulomas are the most commonly reported. The material also serves as a nidus for infection, which can lead to pain, induration, and nodules. Additionally, while in common, devastating complications such as necrosis, abscess, pulmonary embolism, and toxic shock syndrome can occur. Silicone can also be inadvertently introduced into the bloodstream, leading to embolization, sepsis, and even death in some cases. Medical management of these complications has included systemic and local steroids, as well as minocycline, 5 fluorouracil and isotretinoin. Surgical management of major complications include radical excision, laser ablation, and autologous tissue transfer. However, surgical excision of the injected silicone can lead to significant deformities of the face, which brings us to the purpose of our study. So the purpose of this study was to present suction-assisted lipectomy as a less invasive method for softening migrated facial silicone and granulomatosis without the need for medical treatment or aggressive surgical excision. A little bit about the design of our study. Our patient population included 18 male to female transgender patients. Informed consent was acquired after a lengthy discussion with the primary surgeon, including risks and benefits of the procedure. The novel technique was performed, often in conjunction with facial feminization procedures. Um, it's just cheaper and easier for a surgeon to do all of the things at once. Um, Post-operative follow-up occurred at one and two week intervals. And then there was a two month follow-up, which was either at six or eight weeks, depending on the patient. Perceived gender dysphoria was analyzed both pre and post operatively. And as my colleague will discuss in further detail, there was a significant decrease in perceived gender dysphoria among our population. Thank you. So let's chat about the procedure itself. Our surgeon began by delineating the borders of the silicone granulomas through both visualization and palpation. These borders were marked with a marking pin. And then the area was prepped and draped in a sterile fashion. The skin and tissues overlying the granuloma were injected with a 1% lidocaine with epinephrine solution using a one half inch 25 gauge needle. After about a 30 minute waiting period, a one to two millimeter puncture incision was made either in a skin crease or in an area that the surgeon deemed um, most inconspicuous. The subcutaneous pockets of silicone 
were debulked using a 16 gauge Coleman cannula. Multiple passes were made from various different directions. The liposuction was deemed sufficient when minimal resistance to the cannula was noted and palpable granulomatosis sites were no longer present or at least deemed very insignificant. The cannula insertion sites were left open to facilitate drainage and help prevent formation of seroma or human. Eventually a pressure dressing was applied over the treatment area. And like we mentioned before, there was a one week, two week, and then a six to eight week follow-up where patients would come in and we would assess any complications, changes in the granuloma formation and their perceived uh, success of facial criminalization. Between 2018 and 2020, a total of 18 patients underwent suction-assisted lipectomy in combination with facial feminization procedures. These were performed by a single surgeon, Dr. Jess Ting at Mount Sinai. Four of these patients required a second round of liposuction. This was done 16 to 24 weeks postoperatively and was done due to persistent palpability and symptomatic discomfort from the silicone. The patients did not experience any significant postoperative compl complications outside of ecchymosis and transient edema, which was resolved by the two-month follow-up. Minimal further granulomatosis was palpable, and patients reported great improvement to prior tenderness over the area and marked softening and improvement of contour. No other sequelae were noted by the surgeon. So pre and post surgical surveys were administered to each patient to quantify the level of gender dysphoria uh, the patient experienced specific to their face. They used a scale ranging from zero being the least amount of dysphoria to 10 being the most amount of dysphoria. Uh, and the average level of gender dysphoria experienced preoperatively was found to be a nine out of 10. This was reduced postoperatively to a two out of 10, demonstrating significant decrease in the patient's level of dysphoria related to their facial features. You can see here, uh, one of our patients uh, is demonstrated pre and post-operatively, the top being pre-op, the bottom being post-op. Uh, in the pre-op picture, you can see that the silicone originally was injected into her cheeks, has now migrated down into her upper lip, causing significant heaviness there, um, really weighing down her face. You can also see some of the nodularity and induration in that area. You can see post-operatively, there's a much improved fullness of the cheeks, as well as a great deal of softening of that upper lip. It appears much more natural and there's a more feminine contour to her face. In conclusion, our technique resulted in permanent decrease in the palpability, visibility, and discomfort of migrated facial silicone. Additionally, our technique paired with additional facial feminization surgeries resulted in aesthetically pleasing and feminine facial contour. Within our pop population, there were no visible scars secondary to the use of SAL, but most impactful to our patients, there was significant decrease in gender dysphoria related to the face. Some limitations to this technique are that certain patients do require multiple rounds of suction-assisted lipectomy to achieve desired results. In a patient population where there are significant barriers to return to the OR, this can be very problematic. Uh, a potential strategy to combat this is to provide the surgery in an outpatient setting uh, for patients who have the granulomatosis in a anatomically favorable region. As accessibility and affordability of healthcare for transgender patients continues to improve, the demand for physicians trained to provide appropriate care for this population will rise. Correcting unwanted outcomes from prior off-label or illegal cosmetic procedures is important for any physician working with this group. Suction-assisted lipectomy has been shown to be an effective, economical, and less invasive treatment for migrated facial silicone and reactive granulomas. These are our references, and we'll open for questions. Where did you puncture? Can you show them that, that the model where you punctured to actually do the uh, lipectomy? So that's an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, we weren't present for the surgeries themselves. They were performed between 2018 and 2020 prior to our start to medical school and at Mount Sinai. Um, I know by reading some of the reports, some of the incisions were made at the hairline um, and some can be made within the nasolabial fold um, and more hidden areas of the face. 
since you said it migrated into the lip, you know, upper lip, I thought it would probably, it would probably be around the nasal crease or the nasal labial pelvis. In this patient in particular, if you take a closer look at the lower pictures, you can see an incision along the bottom of her nose, and that was most likely where the cannula was inserted. Any thank additional you. questions? That was good. Yeah, thank you. See it now. <laughs> it's, this, it's the same type of reaction. Um, so yeah, granulomatous reaction to the foreign material, just different location. How available are these procedures? Are uh, a lot of surgeons doing them or only select few, do you know? Um, unfortunately, no, not a lot of surgeons are performing this yet. Um, Dr. Justine is a well-known transgender specialist and he's also a, a board certified plastic surgeon. So right now this technique was invented by him and is, was currently only being used by him at the time of the study. We are very happy to report that at least two other physicians that trained under him are fellowship trained and are using this as well but we don't know the total number of people who have been taught this procedure. Hopefully in the future, a lot more. Yes, ma'am. Uh, kind of um, doing it in more of an outpatient setting um, when like a time, when it was like capable, uh, would they not undergo the further feminization of the face in those settings then? Correct. Okay. So many facial feminization surgeries will include like um, rhinoplasty and other more invasive procedures. If you're going, to, right, if you're uh, jaw shaping, shaving of bones, et cetera, if you're going to undergo that, you need to be obviously fully anesthetized and under general anesthesia. Um, however, if you have a lot of frequently like lip injections or cheek silicone, those type of things, if you're not doing additional procedures, could be done in an outpatient setting, as long as you have the equipment. <laughs> <laughs> 